hid the dream to him, saying, Now, does the king ask Daniel to tell him the dream? No, he doesn't. So this is different than the first time that we read about in which he said, tell me the dream and then also tell me its meaning. This time he's only concerned about the meaning. And this time the dream itself concerns him much more than any previous dreams he's had, at least as far as the record seems to indicate. Number two, what irony may be observed in this verse with the name Belteshazzar? The interesting irony of this to me is Daniel had a godly name. That was the name Daniel. He's given a pagan name. The irony is he wants to call him by a pagan name, but he wants an answer from the true God, <laughs> not a pagan God. Mm -hmm. That's pretty ironical. Now, maybe this is an indication, what we pointed out last week, that uh, the change of mind and attitude of Nebuchadnezzar is a gradual change. Obviously, he's been impressed. And he's been made to think. But he's not there yet. But he's getting closer. And I think that uh, we're going to see in chapter 4 that this is going to really make a big difference in his life as a result of having this dream and having it interpreted. Number four, 3, could Spirit of Holy Gods be translated capital S, Spirit of the Holy God? The answer is yes. It can be translated either way. So it all depends on whether you're thinking in terms of his pagan terminology or whether he might be considering, no, I know, Daniel, you serve the real God, the real spirit of the real God. We're just, uh, this is something that when people translate from one language to another, they have to make a decision. And sometimes you may agree with their decision, probably most of the time, but there's sometimes you don't. Uh, a good example of this for each one of you to try out from time to time. Ask yourself when you read your New Testament, how many times when you read the Holy Spirit, just pretend like it said the Spirit of Holiness. And ask yourself the question, would it really change the meaning any? And sometimes it wouldn't change the meaning at all. There are other times you know that he's definitely talking about the third person of the Godhead. But yet at other times it could very easily be talking about the holiness which characterizes our spirit because of the work the Holy Spirit's been doing in our life. Am I confusing you? Does that make any sense? No, no that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you just, it's just kind of hard to know uh, when you capitalize words. And obviously the capital letters indicate the thinking of the people who were involved in the translation and the printing out of it in our language. So I want you to know that in this question number three, the answer is yes, because the language makes it possible to understand it both ways. Just as in the New Testament, the language makes it possible to translate it Spirit of Holiness or Holy Spirit. Verse nine, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. Now why is Daniel called the chief of the magicians? He got promoted when he told him the dream. He sure he did. He's right up there at the top, the chief of all the prefects. He made him ruler of the whole province of Babylon. And that's what you see in the verse that I've indicated there for you back in chapter 2 and verse 48. Did Nebuchadnezzar recognize the truth about Daniel and Daniel's God? Yes, he did. Was Nebuchadnezzar speaking as a pagan at this point? I think that he is. Uh, he still recognizes, Daniel, you've got something different than I have. I'm not fully persuaded, but I've been convinced that you have something that I don't have. Number four, was the, king's, was the king confident in Daniel's ability or his willingness to interpret the dream? It, this is an either-or situation. Which one is it? Or his willingness. Both. His willingness to interpret the dream. All right. You think that he is more confident of his willingness than he is of his ability? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think he has confidence in his ability because he's been right before. You know. And yeah. Well, I I can't argue with that. That certainly is true. If I had to make a decision here, I think that uh, I think that Daniel has proved himself enough to the king that he says, I know you can do this. I just hope you're willing to do it. That's my take on it. But that's what happens when you study the Bible. And that's what makes group studies so important. Because sometimes you'll see things one way and a person will say, I never thought of it that way. And sometimes they're convinced and sometimes they're not. But it's good for us to think and to realize that it could be an alternative. If it were that really important, it would be made, I think, even clearer. All right, verse 10. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. Now was the king studying the dream as he was dreaming? I think he was. Have you ever done that? No. <laughs> While you're dreaming, do you ever wonder why am I dreaming this way and what does oh, this mean? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, I've done that. Well, I have too. I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of <laughs> odd, but uh, <laughs> no, particularly, if I don't, particularly if I wake up in a bad dream, I think, what in the world ever prompted that? I yeah. know. What did I do recently? Where have I been recently? That <laughs> yeah. would even enter my mind. Sometimes it's just way out in left field. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, he's been troubled by this and uh, he's made some observations and he just can't get rid of these thoughts. Number two, were trees used as symbols for royalty in the ancient Near East? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, let me give you a couple scriptures so that you can have a biblical answer. One would be Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Uh, another example would be Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Amos chapter 2 and verse 9. Number three, what's the first thing that impressed the king about this tree? It's great, right? Yeah. He never seen a tree as high as this was before. And of course, the height of the tree is intended to make a real impression upon him. Number four, what is the significance of the location of the tree? Where is it located? In the midst of the earth. Yeah. And where do you think that that makes the king think it must be? Where he is. Right where he is. I mean, the whole world centers around him. Have you ever known people that you <laughs> kind of got the impression the whole world centers around yes. them? Everything, why aren't you doing it my way? You know, I'm the one that knows right. <laughs> well, uh, I think that uh, the king probably was seeing himself uh, being the king of Babylon and the center of the whole universe, he probably thought. Verse 11, the tree grew large and became strong. Its height reached to the sky and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Now, is there progression in this dream? Is the tree continuing to grow? Yeah, and he's probably wondering, when's it ever going to stop? And this really shakes him up. Well, all this is God's doing. This for, takes us back once again to what I've called your attention before, Hebrews chapter 1, the first few verses. In days gone by, God spoke to people in dreams and visions in signs. But these last days, he speaks to us through his son. Two important things about that. Number one, there is a distinction in the way in which God works with people today and the way he worked with people back in Old Testament days. Secondly, there are a lot of people that need to understand God has not chosen to work through dreams and visions today. And the dreams and visions are what is dividing our religious world. Somebody had a dream. Somebody had a vision. And some of the TV evangelists will tell you that they had that dream or they had that vision. But uh, most of the false religions today are based upon a dream that somebody had. A vision that somebody had. And they've started a whole religion centering around what their dream or their vision was. That just doesn't work in New Testament days since the coming of the church. 
Verse 12. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant. And in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. And all living creatures fed themselves from it. Now, are the benefits derived from this tree impressive? Yes. They certainly are. Uh, verse 13. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed and beheld, behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. Now, do we read about watchers anywhere else in the Bible? Yes, but I don't know where. The reason you don't know where is because it's it isn't anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew that. I was trying to yeah, <laughs> trying to trick me, I understand. <laughs> Huh. Well, it's because you gave a wrong answer that we are not recording this today because we would not want to embarrass you. <laughs> no, I am recording it. Well, you are recording it. Yeah. Well, That's you just okay. set it up. Huh? All the recording people watch it are used to hearing this voice say all these stupid things. <laughs> they just don't know it's Julie Tucker. <laughs> now I'm going to be nervous from here on out through the lesson. I thought this was going to be my free day without being taped. Uh, nope. <laughs> Number two. Why would the angel be described as an angelic watcher? He was from heaven. Yeah, I think that's his mission. Yeah. I think he's doing his job. Mm -hmm. a an angel is a messenger. And this angel is sent here with a definite job to do. And he, in finding out what's happening, will be able to report his findings to the Lord. Uh, now, though there are not any watchers as such that I know of in the Bible, the word watcher is a part of pagan religions. Mm -hmm. And so this was a pagan king that is uh, customary uh, to thinking of angels as being watchers over them. And so he automatically assumes that in this particular vision. <clears throat> Number three, what is the significance of the phrase descended from heaven? God. Yeah. So um, this is something that God is concerned about and he's using an angel to uh, get the message that needs to be seen and sh shared. Verse 14, he, referring to the angel, shouted out and spoke as follows, chopped down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Now what is indicated by the chopping down of the tree? I think this is a clear picture of the sovereignty of God. Nebuchadnezzar, you think you are Mr. Number One. You couldn't be more wrong. The Number One is the God of our Father, Lord of our Jesus Christ, Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He's sovereign over all the kingdoms of the world, and the cutting down of the tree is going to give evidence. You think you're the great world power, and yet your kingdom is going to be cut down. God is in control. Uh, there are many evidences of God's sovereignty throughout all of the scriptures. Uh, this is a very important one. Sometimes we forget that God uses pagan people to accomplish his will. Not because he agrees with their methods or their wrong thinking, but he knows how to take what they're doing and who they are to work out to make a point. And he's making a point with this king, and he's making a point with us. I think the cutting down of the tree is a sign that judgment day is coming. And you're going to learn it. Uh, verse 15. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, in the new grass of the field, 
and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Now what part of the tree is to be left? The stump, right. And that'd be including the roots too, right. Stump with its roots. Now what's the significance of the band of iron and bronze around the stump? This is to prevent the stump from splitting, is to hold it together, so it's going to prevent its removal as well as maintain its use because it will have the possibility of growing another tree. Will there be another world power after this one? Oh yes, there will be several. Is this a, a, any significance to the about the sprout coming out of the tree in reference to Jesus? Would this also kind of be a yeah, like a like a the root of Jesse. Yeah, the root of Jesse, how it sprouts out of the tree. That, yeah, but it wouldn't be this particular stuff. No, I know, but would this be kind the of similar, a precursor? Yes, the language. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Very good. good. Sure enough. Okay, thank you. Number three, what is this part of the dream saying about the king? He's going, he's going down. Yeah, he's going to lose his power. Yeah. Now, he's not going to lose his life yet, but he's going to find out that things are going to change. Oh, yeah. And so uh, there will be another kingdom. But... And he's going to lose his ability to reign. But he'll regain it. And following him, there will be somebody else. So is the stump personified in this dream? Sure is. So if the tree, as we pointed out, is emphasizing in other scriptures and in the language of the ancient world, the great kings, then obviously uh, it fits in what's happening to this particular tree and the stump. Verse 16, let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let the seven periods of time pass over him. The tree which represents a man is going to experience what kind of a change? An this man who's a sane man is going to become an insane man. Mm -hmm. This man who acts like a human is going to act like an animal. So he's going to experience a real change in his life and it's going to uh, be dramatic for him and for his kingdom. Now is the language of this verse symbolic? I don't think that it is. I think he's talking very realistically here. This is something that's going to actually happen. Now the thing that happens here is what is called zoanthropy. That's a real disease. Uh, this is not the only record of it in history. Uh, there's a medical journal that relates an experience like this uh, of a man who imagined himself to be like a wolf and made sounds of a wolf and prowled around like a wolf and uh, just everything about him uh, made him think that he was a wolf not a person. So this is a this is a mental illness. I've been trying to think and I just have a poor memory of a few years back there was a person in the news that uh, helped somebody else who had this particular problem. The family was really distraught. They didn't know what to do about it. <clears throat> and uh, this man said, uh, give me a chance to talk with your child. And give me plenty of time. And he related to this person and was able to be helpful. But I just can't remember the specifics of it. That's what I get for not writing it down someplace. Uh, the seven periods of time is uh, something that people are going to debate they have and they will continue to this uh, the number seven because of the way the number seven is used in the book of revelation and because <coughs> much of the book of daniel's apocalyptic i uh, i see a similarity between the meaning of seven in revelation and the meaning of it here 
Uh, not everyone sees it that way, and so this is my opinion. I think seven indicates a specific period of time. But it's a time that God has determined what it will be. Now, hindsight's better than foresight. And in light of historical background looking to that period of time, uh, many have concluded that this seven periods refers to seven years. And I would not argue with that. But that's not, the, that's not what the text is saying. This is seven distinct periods of time. Well, a year is a specific period of time. Some have said it's seven months, but I really think that the evidence is in favor of the seven years. Uh, Jerome and Josephus are two early writers that uh, have concluded this on the basis of all the evidence after the fact that they knew about and studying what the historians wrote concerning that period of time. Uh, both of these men are well known. We don't talk too much about them. I probably mention Herodotus more than anybody else. But he is a very popular historian of that day. And just like historians today, many times historians will be able just like that to give you ready information the rest of us have forgotten about and have not really delved into to find out how specific can we get about this. When something's already happened, then you go back and think, well, when did it happen? You know, we come up all these years when these various peoples were occupying the throne. And how long were they occupying the throne? Well, there has to be something that they can relate to that helps them learn this. Much of what I've put up here on the board, uh, you can validate by going to the British Museum. Uh, there are things that were found by archaeologists, archaeologists in the 19th century through excavations made in that part of the world that are on display in the British Museum today. And more and more people are using this data to study it and examine it with light of everything else. And of course, the work of archaeology will never be over. They're just constantly finding new evidence, uh, constantly finding things that make them question whether they had the proper interpretation of the first bit of evidence they got. But uh, suffice it to say, these, uh, these seven periods of time refer to a, a, a limited period of time. In other words, it's not going to go on forever. So it's going to come to an end, but it's going to be a definite period of time that has been determined by God. That's the important thing for us to remember. Verse 17, this sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestows it on whom he wishes, and sets over it the lowliest of men. Now, what's the significance of the decree of the angelic watchers. Thank you. Well, yeah, and the king is being informed, yes, uh, you're right, you did have a dream. And uh, we can tell you the meaning of that dream. But uh, this is uh, a way in which God is revealing to you what's going to happen to you and how long it's going to last. In other words, it's not, it's not the end of the story of his life. It's going to take up a significant period of time in his life. The, uh, the lesson here, I think, is to everyone who thinks more highly than they ought to think. There's always someone who knows better than we do. And that is true of the rulers of the world. They think, hey, I'm in charge. I'm right where I want to be, I'm going to exert my power. But inevitably, every one of these people are going to be brought down. And that's the lesson that's really made clear here. There's only one ruler, and that's uh, God. Now, what is the higher purpose behind this decree of the angel watchers? Well, he wants them to know that they are not as great as they think they are. Notice how it says here, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. 
The most high is a reference to God. It's not a reference to another man. And then bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Can God take a person that uh, people would have said, there's no way you'll ever mount anything and make them one of the greatest people you ever saw? Mm -hmm. Classic example. I like to think of examples of these so that we get the point. What can we say about the first king that the Israelites had? Started off well and then ended up. Yeah, and why was he selected as king? Because of the way he looked. He was tall, he was handsome. By whose standard? People. People. You're exactly right. Now, who's the second king? The king. And where was he when he was anointed king? He was in his father's house. He was young. <laughs> yeah. In fact, he wasn't even at home that day. He was out in the field taking care of the sheep. <laughs> and all the other sons were standing there knowing that one of them was going to be the next king because Samuel had come there for that purpose. When he got down to the end of the last fellow, he said, don't you have any other fellows in your family? Yeah, one. David. Now, tell me, what does that mean to you today? How, do, how would it relate that to today? Well, let me just challenge you to think a little bit. Now, this is one of the things I used to point out to my students when I was teaching a church administration course. Don't think that because you have a banker in the church, you ought to make him the church treasurer. <laughs> and then I would explain why. A banker is in the business to make money. That's not the business of a church treasurer. The business of a church treasurer is to get rid of it as quickly as you can. And why? That's exactly right. I never will forget, there was a preacher that came to a church in Indianapolis years ago. And I said, why did you accept that ministry? He said, because they're broke. I said, that's a strange reason. He said, no, it isn't. He said, they're, they're giving very well. But he said, they recognize the money is given not to sit in a bank account and make somebody rich. It's given so we can put it to work right away. I think of a church in Southern Illinois that sits on a property that has an oil well. It's the worst thing that ever happened to that church. They just had money galore. They wouldn't even loan it to a missionary. Just a small church. And whether you want to think about it or not, it is true that a lot of bankers I mean, a lot of church treasurers think that they're doing well because they can boast of a big account in their funds. Well, I think it ought to be big, but I think it ought to be big because it was there one minute, the next minute it was gone, mm -hmm. being put to use. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, when you give, well, I think of the India mission right now with their catastrophe over there. Man, that money needs to get to them as quickly as you can get it there. Because right now is when they need it. Right now, people are dying, suffering, need help, need encouragement. So, uh, you know, sometimes I think our values are mixed up. We take a worldly point of view rather than a heavenly point of view. Now, I've talked to you long enough. I don't even know where I am. Which question am I ready Verse for? Verse 18. Verse 18, thank you. I couldn't do it without you folks, you know. If you weren't here, I'd stand up here and think, where am I supposed to be? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be here. Okay. <laughs> Verse 18, this is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation, inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you're able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, did the king tell the dream accurately? I think so, and I think this is verified by the way in which Daniel explains it to him. So Daniel does not say, oh, king, you got part of that dream wrong. No, he's saying, you got it right. And let me tell you exactly what it means. So we'll go from there. By the way, do we ever talk to non-Christians that do say some things that are right? Sure, a lot of people say a lot of things that are right. Oh, 
we're not the ones that have all the knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. but we need to correct them where they might be wrong. In this case, you know, I think of some Christians that, uh, well, let me give you an example. We had a person uh, come to be baptized one Sunday evening at the close of our service. And uh, the people waited while we made preparations for the baptismal service. And before I baptized the individual, I asked them if they believed that Jesus was a Christ, the Son of the living God. And they said that they did. They had a word of prayer with them. And I baptized that person. Afterwards, there, we had a visitor in our service that evening. The visitor stayed around and said, uh, I want to ask you something. I said, okay. He said, that person you baptized, they didn't even cry. I said, are they supposed to? He says, yeah. Don't you have to repent? I said, yeah, you sure do. But I said, are you telling me that you can't repent unless you cry? And I explained to this person, we have to be careful about judging other people by ourselves. Some of the people cry very easily. And other people are very stoic. My mother was stoic. I don't take after her. I cry pretty easily. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you how many Sunday mornings I sit there in a pew and I have to get my handkerchief out to wipe away the tears. Oh, yeah. I'm moved by the message that's being proclaimed. Especially when the sun does it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm not ashamed of that. I just don't want to advertise it. <laughs> So what am I doing talking about it now? <laughs> I shouldn't be talking about it, but I just want to make my point that sometimes we misjudge others because we use our own selves as a standard, but people have their different ways of expressing themselves. Does the king admit that the wise men in his kingdom were unable to explain the dream? Yes. Did the king have any doubt concerning Daniel's ability to interpret the dream? Yes. What caused the king concern over the meaning of this dream? I think he's beginning to think this tree represents me. I think it's soaking in. And I think that's what really troubles him. And it should have. Because that's what it does refer to. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, my lord, that's like saying, sir, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. Now, was Daniel's reaction to the king's request for the correct interpretation of the dream? He was afraid, yeah. you know, and yeah, why was he afraid? Because it was not good. <laughs> That's right. Do you sense that Daniel has grown to be kind of close to this king? Yeah. I think they had a pretty good relationship. I think Daniel was wanting to see all the good that he could see in this man. And obviously, uh, the king has treated him very well, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he also, I think Daniel has respected the authority as being a part of God's will for his life. Doesn't mean he agreed with his paganism, but the king had been tolerant of Daniel, and Daniel is uh, being very careful to respect the king and at the same time not go against the will of God. I think Daniel's the kind of a person that would never violate his conscience. But even though he thinks the other person's wrong, he is going to be kind and respectful to that person. Think about that for a moment. I'm, af I'm afraid that sometimes we as Christians have not been as careful as we ought to be in talking about others. Because the people we're talking to, as well as us, know the faults of the others. Who was it? Abraham Lincoln said, there's so much good in the worst of us that behaves the rest of us to speak, to be nice to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I read something 
just recently in which the person was relating somebody who was treating them very unfairly. And their comment was, I'm going to try to smother them with goodness. I like that. How to get rid of an enemy? Number one, make him a friend. And how do you make a friend? By criticizing him? No. By putting him down? No. By ignoring him? No. But by seeing what good you can and magnifying the good. I think that's what Daniel's doing here. I think he's a good example for us in so many ways. But here he's uh, uh, not going to comply with anything that he says to him that he has to do that's contrary to God's will. But where he can do some good for him and help him, he's glad to do it, willing to do it. But this is going to be a difficult thing for him. Uh, there, there are a lot of difficult things that we need to say. And sometimes, because it's hard to say it, we just don't say it. But it needs to be said in a nice way. Does the king sense Daniel's hesitation to interpret the dream? Yes. Sure does. Does Daniel's response to the insistence of the king for an interpretation indicate that they enjoyed a good relationship with each other? Yes. I think so. Verses 20 and 21. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and his foliage was beautiful and his fruit abundant, in which there was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and whose branches the birds of the sky lodged? Has Daniel repeated the dream accurately as the king had reported it to him? Yes. yes. And I think that verifies that this he's told it right. Mm -hmm. Because if there had been a mistake, Daniel would have pointed that out because God is working through Daniel. Verse 22. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong. Your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. Now, who is the tree in the king's dream? Yeah. That's right, Nebuchadnezzar. Would this part of the interpretation be difficult for the king to accept? Yes. Not this part. The second part. Oh. I think he thinks he's great. <laughs> yeah, I think he does too. I think he's, what do you call him, an egomaniac? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's what he is. Verse 23. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven, and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. And let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. Has this part of the dream been repeated accurately? Yes. Yes. So we now come to the interpretation. Since the king realizes the king has heard him correctly. This is the interpretation, verse 24. O king, this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king like saying, upon you, sir, who now is reigning as king, that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Does Daniel make it clear that the interpretation is not the opinion of man, but comes from God? Yes. Sure does. This is the decree of the Most High, is what he's saying here. Most High being an obvious reference to God. Does Daniel make it clear to the king the reason behind what will happen to the king? Mm -hmm. Sure does. Yeah. Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Mm -hmm. What's he saying with that sentence? Change your ways. <laughs> right. It's not a thing, no. Does God know a dictator when he comes to the dic dictatorial realm in his life? Yes. Sure does. 
Is God permitting it to happen? Sure he is. has many, many times. Yeah. This cannot be overly emphasized, I believe. It's so easy for us to think that if it's God's will, everything has to be just perfect. Well, there is such a thing as God's permissive will. And that's a distinction we need to make, but needs to be understood. Because everything that God permits that he doesn't really want to happen, but he's going to allow it to happen, has a purpose. And that purpose is always to point out what? The supremacy of God. Mm -hmm. You think you know? Let me prove to you that you don't know. You think you're great? Let me knock you down a peg or two. I think that's what he's saying here. Glenn, would that also include like free will that we have? The free will that um, God has given us that and so it all works together to show that um, the love that God has we couldn't be without free will because of you're so right that has joined it must have broken the Lord's heart when Judas kissed him to betray him what did Judas know well, he was one of those fellows that helped pass out the loaves and fishes to 5,000 plus the women and children. Then later on to 4,000 plus the women and children. God has been so good to everybody. And he's witnessed this. What got in his way? What happened along the way? His grief for money. And what does that tell us? Do, do most people have a weak spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And that weak spot's not always the same for each one of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's selfishness. But God is going to enable us through His Son and the Holy Spirit to have the power to overcome all evil influences in our life. But it gets back to free will. You're exactly right. The thing that makes free will so important is the real joy comes not because a person did something because they knew they had to do it, but because they wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the, the power of God and the love of God and what he's done in history, if that doesn't convince us, what else is there to convince us? And yet there's some people that, you know, they just refuse to be convinced. They don't want to be convinced. I, uh, <laughs> when you think of what happened back in Noah's day, simply because of the world's population was so evil, and the fact that we even have a reminder of it to, in our world today, of that rainbow. And yeah, people just look at it and, I'm looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We sing nice songs about the rainbow. And, yeah, you're, you're right. He, uh, and, and this Nebuchadnezzar, he had free will. And that, is God being patient with him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's not zapping him. He's not forcing him, but he sure is troubling him. <laughs> I wonder sometimes when things don't go, when, you know, we have that bad day. I wonder sometimes if God's saying, hey, this is no accident. I'm trying to say something to you. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to prepare you. Well, I'll tell you, folks, you don't think that way until you've been in the Word for a while. But the more you read and study the Word of God, the more you realize God works in so many interesting ways. And to read about how God worked in the life of Joseph, in the life of David, in the life of Daniel, the life of Elijah, the life of the Apostle Paul, oh, what a variety of experiences. And yet, each step along the way, God was there, not making them, but encouraging them, prodding them, making them think. Good response. Does Daniel make it clear to the king the reason behind what will happen to the king? Yes. Yes, 
He does. Had Nebuchadnezzar failed to recognize and appreciate the sovereignty of God prior to having this dream? Yes. yes. That's right. He has. And that's why God is dealing with him in this really impressive way. Now, think about this. He doesn't uh, give him the mumps. He doesn't have him fall down and break his leg. He troubles his mind. Now, is there any relationship between the kind of suffering that Nebuchadnezzar is experiencing and the problem that he has? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there sure is. Mm -hmm. His mind is operating overtime, making him think more out of himself than he ought to. And so let's kind of bring you down a peg or two. So he's working on his mind and his behavior. Does the punishment the king will experience make clear just how important the recognition of God's sovereignty is to him? Yes. Yes. I think that the important part of this dream is the insanity that's going to take place. Yeah. The insanity. Verse 26. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is in heaven that God rules. So what hope is offered in the dream as interpretation? Could win eventually. Yeah. In other words, here is an opportunity, Nebuchadnezzar. You've had opportunities before and that didn't work. Here's another opportunity. There's always going to be that last opportunity. We never know when that's going to come. But many times it takes something to really kind of shake us up in our thinking to encourage us to act uh, sanely. Number two, in what sense are we to understand that it is heaven that rules? Wow. When we're using the word heaven here, we're really talking about whom? God, right. God, right. And they would recognize that as we recognize it today. So this is reverence to God. He's the true ruler. He is sovereign. He's in charge. He has the ultimate control. And you will always be submissive to him one way or another. Verse 27. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. What advice does Daniel give to Nebuchadnezzar? Righteousness. Yeah. What do you mean by break away now from your sins? Repent. What is what is his sin? Thinking he's just higher than God, not recognizing God is supreme. That's his that's his big sin. That's his big sin. Would it be correct to say that that's probably the big sin of most people today? Mm -hmm. The ego. That's right. And everything else becomes more important to them than God. In fact, that's something we as Christians have to be concerned about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To make sure that we never lose sight of the fact that God is in control, that we're here to serve Him, to live for Him. Um, in His living in luxury, He probably was uh, guilty of not having the proper respect for the poor and the needy, the sick and the dying, lack of mercy on His part, Number two, is the advice of Daniel similar to that of Isaiah 1, 16, 17, which reads, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, <coughs> defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Your answer would be? Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Can the king break away from his sins without doing what is right? No. No, he cannot. So what sins plague Nebuchadnezzar? These are the ones I've listed. You can add to them. I have pride and greed, egotism, selfishness, lack of love and concern for others' well-being, a bad mental attitude. Those are the ones that come to my mind rather quickly. Was he fat too? <laughs> Could have been. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right. Well, sin is the problem of every age and something we have to constantly combat ourselves 
combat against in our battle for the truth and righteousness. Why did Daniel urge the king to repent? So he didn't have to go through that. Yeah. And what did Daniel know that the king needed to understand? That God is a forgiving God. Uh, maybe you've known people like this. Maybe you've just heard of people like this. But there are some people that say, you don't know me very well. God can't forgive me. In light of the kind of life I live, it just can't be done. And I think, no, the problem is you don't know God very well. I think that's really important. And to me, that's another big point in this whole story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Here's a person who has everything that the world has to offer. He can do things his own way, and all, all of a sudden, he's really troubled about this. Not because he wants to be troubled about it, but because he can't shake the thought of what he's been dreaming about. And God is going to say, okay, I see you're troubled. Now let me sh let you know that I really mean what I'm doing to you. I'm troubling you for a purpose. The thing that I find very interesting in this, he's not going to escape the punishment. He just isn't. But as we talk about today, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's that stump. There's going to be that new tree. You can start life all over again. And I feel sorry for people that keep wanting to bring up their own sort of past. That's gone. It's as if it never existed. We have a clean slate. And this fellow's about to experience that, I believe. So he, he wants him to know the kind of a God that Daniel serves. He's a kind of a person that will not take it out on a person unnecessarily, but anything he does is going to be for their own good to try to help them in the best way that he can. Now, beginning with verse 28 and going all the way down through verse 34, we're going to observe that the record is presented to us in the third person. What does that mean? Um, somebody else wrote it. Not yeah. Yeah. Somebody else is narrating this. They're looking at this, and this is what's going to happen. At this point, it's been, this is what happened. This is what Daniel's saying. This is what Nebuchadnezzar's saying. Now we're going to step back, and we're going to look at the scene and say, and this is what happened in this whole story. And after we get down to verse 34, we're going to pick it up again, and at that time, we're going to talk about what they actually can say with their sanity. Now, why would this be in the third person? Because now we're going to visit the insane part of his life. We're going to see him out there eating the grass, acting like an animal, living like an animal, unable to exercise his authority as king. But our time is up, so that's where we'll start next week. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, it's so good to study your word with other people. The questions and the thoughts that are expressed add to our knowledge and understanding and to our thought process. And that's what we want to do. We want to see things as other people see them. We want to go get a better understanding for ourselves. This story is an interesting story. But God help us to look beyond the interest of the story and see the application of its truths for us who are not kings in any respect of the term. But we are people that are sinners and are saved by grace. <coughs> we do make decisions from day to day. And we want our decisions to be in harmony with your will. So use what we learn in our weekly Bible studies, both as an encouragement, as helpful instruction, and as warnings to avoid by learning from the mistakes of others. I thank you for each one who is here. May your richest blessings be with all of them. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.
is a treat. She asked, why didn't they get another king? And where was he during all this time? Most of the writers that I've read conclude that, uh, well, let me say it this way. We'll talk about this next week. But in, in that day, in that part of the world, the, uh, you never dealt harshly with an insane person. Do you remember somebody in the Bible that pretended to be insane that wasn't? David did. David did. That's right. And why? Did